are we all? Blessed? Amen. Well, I'm going to get straight into it because this is part three of exposing the enemy. Um, and there's a bit to get to. So forgive me if I'm quick, but there's only so much I can get out in one hour. Has everyone got their manuals? Yep. yep, good. And if you've got your iPads or your iPhones or you're looking on that, switch it over to ESV. Yep, ESV. <laughs> okay, let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the week we have had, whether it be good or bad. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you have given us and all that you provide. Lord, for those that didn't have this week, double portion next week, Lord. Lord, we ask you to be in our midst, and we ask for all spiritual eyes and ears and minds to be opened. Come and dwell with us in this place, your place, Lord. In Jesus' name, the house says, Amen. Amen. All right, so part three principalities. As a brief overview, the first one was battle for souls. Simply put, the Great Commission, a command, our job. The second was a detailed look at demons, what they are, what they aren't, what they can do and what they can't do, and what you can do, most importantly. Now today, the third instalment, Principalities. As you probably are aware, we can all quote Ephesians 6.12. I know I cop it all the time. But I ask, how many really know and understand the meaning of the words, the implications, and the enemy that is behind it? I ask this because I didn't really even appreciate it, the depth behind it, until I asked. And God gave revelation through Scripture. That's the important bit. So when I'm up here, I cop it first. I cop what I need to get whether it be good or bad, happy or sad. And then I pass it on to you. <laughs> be blessed. <laughs> so that's what we're going to have a look at today, principalities. Are they a friend or a foe? Do they trouble or help cities? States, regions, and entire nations. Or both. Mm. To do this, we need to go back. Back to the Old Testament. Don't worry about Ephesians 6. We need to look at what it actually is. We need to look and discover the roots and the why and the who of it all to really understand our enemy. It's not good enough to read a word and go, I believe. If you don't understand, what are you going to do about it? Okay, so what or who, more importantly, are principalities ruling over cities, regions, nations, and ourselves? Let's look at the word. Definition of principality. One, the state, office, or authority of a prince. Two, the position or responsibility of a principal. Three, the territory or jurisdiction of a prince, a country that gives title to a prince. And four, principalities, plural an order of celestial hierarchy. 
That's the actual definition. Now, if we look at that, the state, office, or authority of a prince. So it's a person or an entity, as we can see by the last one. So it's a who, not a what is a principality. It's a who. There's your first one. In saying that, we must also remember there are good and bad principalities. For that, we will go to the start. But before that, let's go to Daniel 10. This will give us a bit of a look at the players to be able to ingrain what a principality is. Daniel 10, 12. I'm going to go 12, 13, then 20, 21. But don't worry, it should be on the screens. If it isn't... Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard. Lock that in. Humbled yourself... Before God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I was left there with the kings of Persia. Now some scholars debate these are people. They are not people. They are heavenly people. They are angels. They are celestial beings sent by God by a word. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. There's a few principalities and princes right there, fighting over nations. The prince of Persia and the prince of Greece are mentioned, along with the person that is talking, who is a principality, and his helper, Michael, the archangel. Daniel 12, 1 to 4. Daniel 12, 1 to 4. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. Now I could have gone back to First Enoch here and shown you where it says Michael is in charge of us. He's our head principality and he takes care of us. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered. Amen? Oh, oh no. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life. And some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness, great commission, like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So this shows us a scriptural foundation for principalities. I've shown you four right there. Persia, Greece, Michael, and the one who was talking to Daniel. Because he has come to help. So how and where did it go wrong? Where did it go pear-shaped? And how did all this come to pass? For that we need to go back even further. Because first there was the Eden debacle. <laughs> then came the flood. Then the Babel incident. Let us head to Genesis 11, 1. Genesis 11.1 1 says, Now the whole earth had one language, lock that away, and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. They knew what they were doing. Humans. Hmm. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel or Babel. Have you ever thought what? You're a babbler. In Aussie, that's dribbler. Because the, there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Now we can see from this Yahweh divided the people into separate regions and nations with different boundaries and languages. Because they got ahead of themselves. And he saw what they were doing. This is scripture. So the Babel incident is something that kicked off principalities. For this, we need to go to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, concentrating on verses 8 and 9, give us gives us the view of the puzzle, gives us a 30,000 foot view of the puzzle in greater detail. Just as we read in First Enoch how the Genesis 6 incident, Enoch, First Enoch gave us greater detail into what, why, when and how. 
Deuteronomy 32 does the same for Genesis 11. So Deuteronomy 32, 1 to 10. It's a bit of a long one, but I'll get through it. Give ear, O heavens, I, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teachings drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass, and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness, faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are crooked and twisted generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Now this is where they go back to the Genesis term, as you can see from Scripture, because he says, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the numbers of the sons of God. I could stop right there. Because sons of God are angels. They're angelic beings. They're not people. There is an argument, however, that in some translations it says sons of Israel. The issue with that is there is no Israel at the moment. So how could that be? Israel hasn't been made yet. Israel isn't even a person yet. Jacob has not been called Israel by God yet. So in the original translations, it is Elohim, sons of God, angels. This is where it details the principalities were given the boundaries and the borders and divided mankind and each were placed in charge. Deuteronomy 32, 16, move ahead a bit, gives you another reason as to why. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently whom your fathers had never dreaded. So now we're getting the picture of the why and how. Humans. <laughs> yes, it was us, again. So who are they? If you haven't connected the dots yet, principalities are essentially Elohim, angelic beings, sons of God, angels, 
Remember, okay, if you haven't watched the last two, I actually gave you a ranking of authority of celestial hierarchy. Their job descriptions, in essence. So a principality is a job description. Your job is to be principal of the USA. Your job is to be principal of Argentina. Your job is to be principal of Golden. Your job, (laughs) and so on and so forth. Now, importantly, with rank and authority, this rank and authority was given out by Yahweh himself. Good or bad, happy or sad. Now, we don't know where they went bad, but as we know, fallen are fallen. Not all of them got shoved into Tartarus, that was only 200 of them. And like everything, God gave his human family free will and choice. As too, he gave his celestial family free will and choice. They made up their own minds. That's not for us to really worry about. What I'm trying to give you is the enemy, who they are, why, what they're capable of, not how they got there. Because it was their choice to go good or bad. We all know Michael's good, yeah? We all know there are bad principalities as well. And we can see this in Psalm 82. Psalm 82, if you picture it in your head, is the divine counsel. So God is standing there in the divine counsel, looking at everyone. Psalm 82, 1. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Remember, in Hebrews, the word gods is Elohim. Elohim can be singular for God and plural for angels. Okay? So when you see gods, don't get all freaked out and go, oh, it's going Greek. So he's in the midst of the gods and he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High. All of you, nevertheless, like men, you shall die. That's a judgment. Straight up. To the angels. He's calling out the bad principalities here, saying, Why did you not look after them? Why? Because they chose to do bad. They chose. I have all this power now, this rank and authority. 
I'll do what I think is right. Like men you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. So we can see that God called them out. He called them into a meeting in the divine council and said, some of you are being naughty. So instead of you being eternal beings, you shall now die like men. Hammer came down. Judgment. So where are they going? Isaiah 24, 21. Isaiah 24, 21. Says, on that day the Lord will punish the hosts of heaven. In heaven and the kings of the earth. On the earth. They will be gathered together as Prisoners in a pit. Sound like First Enoch much? Mm. They will be shut up in a prison. And after many days, they will be punished. Now the hosts of heaven aren't us. Isaiah 34.1 Isaiah 34.1 says... Draw near, O nations, to hear and give attention, O peoples. Let the earth hear, and all that fills it, the world, and all that comes from it. For the Lord is enraged against all the nations, and furious against all their hosts. He has devoted them to destruction, has given them over for slaughter. Their slain mountains shall flies roll up like a scroll, a scroll, all their fig tree. But not yet. Hi, and welcome to the House of the Lord here at Mahanaim Life Ministries. I am Pastor Pax Cordova. I am bringing this special broadcast to you and just to you. There is no one here, just you. Why? Well, in my last sermon, part three of exposing the enemy, principalities, um, from the 27th minute, some funny stuff happened. You can go back. I'm leaving it on there, so you can actually go back and have a look at the first part. And if you want to fast forward, fast forward. But I le I'm leaving it there because I'm going from the 27th minute and rebroadcasting that. So I'll give you a bit of a background into what happened. As we were live streaming, which we use Wi-Fi for, at the 27th minute, something interfered with it or someone, I'll say that. So from the 27th minute on, it was jumbled, it was garbage, it was all over the shop, it was, and I didn't know it, and we didn't know it as it was happening. But after the service, and people started saying, oh, we couldn't see the rest of the sermon, I went back and had a look. And as I was watching, I had my notes with me and I was scrolling up and down and seeing where I was and what was going on and why. And exactly at the 27th minute and 40th second, it started freaking out. And at that time, it was exactly when I was calling the enemy out and exposing what was going to happen to them and their plan. So in essence we have a visual cue 
of Lucifer himself interrupting the broadcast going out live. Now it's funny because one of the uh, scriptures that I call him out on and that is applicable for this is Ephesians 2.2. Now I won't put that up at the moment because I'm just going to read it. In which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, the prince of the power of the air. Here's the prince of the airwaves. Now, we aren't hardlined, so we don't plug anything into a hard line that then goes out. We are over Wi-Fi, which is in the air. Now to me, it's, it's very simple. If I'm calling out one of his strategies and he doesn't like it and he gets told about it, he's going to come and do something about it. We now have literal evidence of sabotage on his behalf. So I urge you to go back and watch the first part just so you can get the understanding of where we are in this, because I'm not going to do the first part again. I'm just going to go from where he sabotaged it. Okay? Now, people might say, oh, well, that was just a coincidence. Uh, uh, oh, that was just a glitch. Whatever you want to think, I know what happened. Exposing his last day end time plan hurts him so he doesn't want it out there which is why I'm doing this special rebroadcast for you okay so this is exposing the enemies part three principalities from the 27th minute okay now in the first part we talked about I talked about who they were I how they came into being and why they came into being. This second part is looking at where they are destined and why. Let's start with the why. Let's start with Psalm 82.1. So this is after the Babel incident in Deuteronomy 32. This is the grand overview of that. Psalm 82, 1. God has taken his place in the divine council, in the midst of the gods. He holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High. All of you, nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Now, as we talked about what principalities were, princes of their region or domain, he's not talking about us here. He is talking about his angelic hierarchy, his divine council, the ones that are in charge of all this. They are in charge over us. You can see this by when he says, you are gods, Elohim. Elohim is plural in this case. God is also Elohim, but that's singular. Okay, there's a, a nuances there. Your sons of the Most High. And this is where he judges them with a finality judge. There's no repentance from this. There is no getting away from it or, or maybe he will change his mind. This is the judgment for them. 
and the judgment is you shall die and fall like any prince like men you shall die remember they're immortal they're immortal beings they're they're angels now they have been judged to die like men O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. In Isaiah 24, 21. This is also being read from the ESV, okay? So if it's a bit different from yours, switch it over to the ESV. Isaiah 24, 21. On that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth. Let me read that again. On that day the Lord will punish the host of heaven. In heaven. And the kings of the earth. On the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in a prison. And after many days they will be punished. They know where they're going. They know their finality. There's no getting away from this. Isaiah, th- bit up the road, Isaiah 34, 1. Isaiah 34, 1 says, Draw near, O nations, to hear and give attention, O peoples. Wake up, church. Let the earth hear and all that fills it, the world and all that comes from it. For the Lord is enraged against all the nations and furious against all their hosts. He has devoted them to destruction, has given them over for slaughter. Again, up the road a bit, 34.4 says, All the hosts of heaven shall rot away, and the skies roll up like a a scroll. All their hosts shall fall as leaves from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree. Now this is where the original version at 27.40 or so, Lucifer starts playing, with the tape that's why I've got it from here because now it jumps ahead it jumps back it jumps here it jumps there it jumbles it up so you cannot understand the rest of this he knows we are about to open up a sore point and he doesn't like it so he has to do something about it but I'm going to tell him it's not going to work because now I'm hardlined. I'm hardlined in. You can't take this one away. So if you notice from now on, I'm letting him know we know his plan. We know where they are destined and we know they're not going to win. Second Peter 2.4 2 Peter 2.4 says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Ephesians 2.2, which we already talked about, which is why this is happening, in which you once walked according to, to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Revelation 9.11. Remember, we're still talking about what's happening to them and where they're going. It's not a nice place. We know this. Revelation 9.11 says, And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, 
But in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. Revelation 9, 11. In 1 Corinthians 15, 23. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 says, But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. After destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it sing, says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is expect, accepted who put all things in subjection under him. So now, we, we, from the first part, we know who they are. We know their job. And we also know their authority. Because God gives them the authority, as we read. We also now know their final destination. What can we do about it? This is where I had to repent and find out that I didn't have the authority to deal with principalities. Okay? Jesus gave us the authority to do as he did in many scriptures. To heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons in his name, and to preach the gospel to the whole world. Scripture emphasizes Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. In saying that, I shall also say this. Nowhere in Scripture does it say we have the rank or authority or place over principalities. As we read in Scripture, we have authority over certain things. This is not one of them. It tells us in Scripture that we are a bit lower than the angels. It's not until we get to go to heaven that we get to judge the angels. There is a scripture for that as well. But let's just stay here for a second, finding out the scripture about being a bit lower than the angels. Psalm 8, 5. Psalm 8, 5 says, Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Again, in Hebrews 2.5, Hebrews 2.5 says, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower, a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet, now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. So, through the cross is the same scripture saying, little lower than the angels. So, you can see 
we don't have authority over principalities. We have total authority over demons. We have total authority over the creepy crawly things. But we don't have authority or rank of principalities. So now that we have scriptural understanding of the role and scope of principalities, which is in the first one, so go back and have a look at the first one. And for their judgment that has already been set, which we read in Psalm 82, and that we don't have the rank and authority to deal with them, here is our reality check. The real, be que real question becomes, what are the evil principalities? Remember, there's good principalities and evil principalities. What are they really afraid of? Here comes the blueprint to their plan. So what are they afraid of? Clearly it's not us, as it is written. Their judgment has already been preset and told to them. They already know this. They're not silly. They're not stupid. So who, or more aptly, what is it that they are afraid of? Losing their subjects, losing their enslaved masses. Many are enslaved by what they see, what they hear, what they read, what they think. Many are enslaved by their own opinions. Principalities are in charge of that. They are afraid of losing us. Non-believers and believers alike. Thus ending the war and sending them to their final destination. We know they win a battle or two. But... They also know they already lose the war. We have, in Revelations, we have the end of the book. We know what happens at the end of the movie. We know where they're going. They know where they're going. So why are they playing this? Why are they playing it like this? It's not because, oh, oh if, we can, if we can get as many as we can, sure, yeah. They're going to drag as many as they can down with them. They're not stupid. They know how this plays out. They know how it ends and where they're going, which ain't good. So what's the go? Why do they keep trying to win a lost battle? What's their real end game? Listen up. They have a plan. Think about it this way. The balance needs to be tipped for the end to come and Jesus to come back. And the war to be lost. Their end game is the long game. Their end game is to stretch their fade out as long as they can. Which is why you are seeing so much division around the world, in the nations, in the church. It's their end game. They are trying to divide, not conquer, but stretch out their fate. They want to be around for as long as they possibly can. And that is how they're doing it. They're deceiving. They're delaying. And they're keeping the balance equal or tipped into their favour. And they're trying to take as many of us down as they possibly can. 
All this has to come to pass, as we read in Scripture, before Jesus can return. Which, if you think about it, in essence, is the Great Commission or the fullness of the Gentiles. Look at China, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, Africa. Any place where the dominance was on the other side. Which is now, thanks to underground churches, underground pastors and people willing to die for their faith, to see the Great Commission come to fruition... And it's also Jesus himself. How many times have you heard a Muslim coming to Christ through a dream of Christ saying something to him? I've heard it many, many times. I've read it many, many times. And I'm sure you have too. This is how it's changing. He's starting to tip it back in Yahweh's favour. So what can we do? What can we, the saints, the remnant, his warriors? Remember, this is a war, people. We are in a battle every day. I can't emphasize that enough. I say it every time I'm up here. And I don't believe the church really sees it for what it is. A battle. Not just for your souls. Yes, it's a battle for your souls. But it's also a battle every day to keep that balance point in their favour. So they can stretch it out as long as they can. They know where they're going. They know they don't win. All they can do is stretch it out as much as they can. So what can we do? Well, as we've read, we don't have the rank or authority to bind or tell them to leave. However, we do have the rank and authority as children of God to ask God to loose and send the appropriate ranking authority to deal with them. See, We read it in Daniel. Our prayers go up. He hears our prayers and he sends a messenger, an angel, a messenger angel down to deal with the issue or to deliver a message or a principality like Michael to deal with the prince. As we read in Daniel. We have to unite in prayer, corporately, and individually, to God to send the proper authority to deal with the principalities. That is how we are going to make this speed up and not... I don't know about you, but I don't know how long I've been hearing Oh, we're in the end times. It's almost time. Jesus is coming back. I've been hearing that for decades. Near on three decades I've been hearing that. And I've been getting ready and ready and ready and ready and ready and ready and ready. ready. But now we have a game plan. Now we have a way to end all this. We need to ask God in prayer and supplication, as it is written, for righteous principalities to be set in place to reclaim our cities, our states, our regions and our nations.
and complete the command of Jesus, of the Great Commission. Tipping the scales back into our favour and ending this. Bringing us back almost full circle to the first part of this instalment, which was called the Battle for Souls, which was all about the Great Commission. Think about it. If we can send the word out, which we are doing, and save as many people as we can and turn them to God, that will end the war sooner than later. This is true spiritual warfare. This is the battle. This is the 30,000 foot view of what's going on. We do this by the knowledge of his word. We do this by belief and righteousness and faith through Christ and his word. They are our victory. It is written in 2 Timothy 3, 13. 2 Timothy 3, 13. It says, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in all things which you have learned and been assured of. Why assured of? Why, because you don't believe anymore? Hmm. Knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, how should we be walking to achieve this? 1 Corinthians 10, 20. 1 Corinthians 10, 20 says, Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. We need to get off the fence, church. We need to get off the fence, saints. Trust me, I've been on I was on the fence for a long time, a long long time. So, we now know their end game. Stretch it out. Stretch their future out for as long as they can and take as many of us with them. When we recognize this and humble ourselves and cleanse our houses, self, being made holy and righteous, through the asking of forgiveness and repentance, we will have individual and corporate victory. 
and the Lord will hear our prayers. I'll say it for you. Amen. As it is written in Revelations 8.2. Revelations 8.2 says, Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. I'll say that again. With the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense. With the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain Burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. Romans 8.35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or a sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? That is a perfect circle. I want to give glory to God for letting this happen and letting us see how he sabotages Satan here, Lucifer, the big S, not the little S. How he sabotages what goes out. How he makes what is good and profitable into what could be scrambled up to be vile we have proof visual and audible proof of this happening I I personally have never seen it before I know stuff has gone down before and has gotten I've done conferences where we've lost stuff and but we've always had a backup So we could always do something about it. This one he knew we didn't have a backup. Which is why I'm back doing this one. Because it needed to get out. We need to know his end game. We need to know the principality's end games. So we can be on the front foot. We already know how this ends. And now we know a bit more of what they are trying to do. 
So I implore you, church. I implore you, saints. Now is the time. To get down on our knees and ask for forgiveness in humility and ask for the proper principles to come down and reign in our cities, reign in our countries, reign in our nations. What's happening all around the world that we can see is not by chance it's not a fluke it's not a circumstance it's it's happening because it is written we are at war this is a battle this is a battlefield when are we going to wake up and realize it when are we going to do something about it? I implore everyone to get up and do. Be doers of the word, not just hearers. I thank you for listening. And be blessed. Know where you are going. Know who you are in Christ. And know the enemy. For Mahanaim Ministries, Life Ministry, and the Ultimate Spirit Warriors Boot Camp, this is Pastor Pax. Blessings to you all. Packs out.